Now to tonight's guest, Julian Assange, the founder of the WikiLeaks website that this week released to the world more than 90,000 secret U.S. military intelligence documents on the Afghanistan war. We caught up with him earlier this evening in London. Julian Assange, thanks for joining us. You're welcome, Tony. Having uh, immersed yourself in the detail of these documents, what's, what is the key significance of them? What do you believe will be the major impact of releasing them? Well, I think it will be the vast scale of activities and abuses that are represented here. We're talking about 92,000 uh, reports occurring over a six-year period uh, uh, from the regular U.S. Army comprising of nearly every uh, death that has occurred uh, in Afghanistan as a result of U.S. activity uh, or to uh, U.S. forces. So what I see is it's not the, the big headline things like... Um, another Kunduz or Gurani with a, a big bombing, or well, those are represented, but rather it is where the most kills are. Um, it, uh, it's the small events taking off a child here, or a, or a deaf man there or running away, uh, or, or a family or a village that has been um, shelled in, in revenge or by accident. That, that's my big takeaway from this, that it's, it's, if you like, not just the bus accidents of war, but all the car accidents, all the pedestrian accidents that actually make up the, the big kill figures in the end. We're talking about 20,000 people, uh, the stories behind 20,000 kills uh, represented in this material. You've actually made uh, comparisons between the release of these documents and the opening up of the East German Stasi archives. Uh, of course, the Stasi files revealed repression and criminal activity on a massive scale. You're not alleging anything like that, are you? There's, there's negligence that's on a massive scale. Um, I wouldn't say that there's criminal activity or deliberate targeting uh, of civilians uh, by US forces on a, on a massive scale, maybe just a few individual events. But we do see uh, the sort of squalor of war uh, coming out on a massive scale and the, the destruction of uh, Afghan society. Also, we can see uh, um, the increase in the war uh, tempo and the number of uh, kill events occurring over time. It's, it's getting worse uh, over at least the last um, three years. And now uh, the general public and academics and journalists have the, the raw ingredients that the Pentagon was using to monitor and assess the war and come up uh, with its own aggregate figures uh, as to the number of civilian casualties and, and how the war is heading. And people can see in some cases that the, the raw ingredients are a bit faulty uh, so there's some misreporting by, by ground units, but it also permits people to sort of come up with a, a different conclusion uh, about how the war is going and how it should go. You said in your uh, press conference that uh, you and the conventional journalists you'd worked with had, had only managed to read between one and 2,000 of the reports properly. Is that correct? Yeah, that is true, to, to, read, them, to read them in detail. Um, uh, and that there's just there's just so many material so much material uh, we maybe had um, 20 people across the four organizations uh, working on this full time uh, and only for um, about a, a month for the other organizations and about six weeks uh, for us so how many of the of the reports that you put on WikiLeaks uh, went onto the site without you actually knowing the detail of what was in them? It's, it's fair to say that, um, that only 2% have been read uh, in precise uh, detail and the rest have been hived off uh, using these classification systems. Now, uh, I, I presume what your question is, is getting to is um, what, how did we split off the 15,000 that we have not yet released because we think they need uh, further review? Uh, to understand uh, whether there might be innocent informers' uh, names in there. So after reviewing uh, several different sort of types of material, um, we saw that it was really um, these uh, threat reports and some other classifications uh, that contained uh, information about informers. So those were all hived off. Well, not according to the Pentagon. Uh, they're accusing you of revealing the identities of... Uh Afghan informants and putting their lives at risk. Afghan's President Karzai agrees with that. He says the breach is extremely irresponsible and shocking. Your response to those comments? Well, we, we have yet to see clear evidence of that. I mean, 
Uh, the London Times is also making this alle allegation uh, today and in a quite disingenuous way. Uh, for example, they mentioned some informers' names they say they had found and, and with the headline, Afghan informer already dead. But when you actually read the story, uh, what you see is in fact uh, that individual that they're mentioning died two years ago. Uh, so there's a little bit of media manipulation uh, occurring here. Uh, in terms of the, the Afghan government, it, it's their interest to sort of play up the irresponsible, irresponsibility of the United States um, that they say has been involved in sort of collecting and permitting this data to release, be released. Now, we contacted the White House uh, as, a, as a group uh, before we released this material and asked them to help assist in going through it um, to make sure that no innocent names came out. Uh, and the White House did not uh, accept that request. So you're saying that you offered the White House a chance to go through the documents or officials from the White House a chance to go through the documents and single out names of people at risk, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Not, not of course, we uh, did not offer them uh, an, a, cha a chance to, to veto uh, any material, but rather we told them we were going through a harm minimisation process and uh, offered them the chance to point out names uh, of informers um, or other innocents uh, who might be harmed. And uh, they de uh, did not respond uh, to that request, uh, which was mediated uh, through the New York Times, who was, our, who was acting as the, the contact for the four media groups involved in this. Now, I imagine as an Australian, you've paid special attention to material that's related to Australian troops. We've seen uh, relatively few so far and relatively insignificant uh, references, but are there more documents that you know of uh, in, in the files that have direct implications for Australia's involvement in the war in Afghanistan? We haven't spent special attention uh, yet on Australia, but there, you'll find that as you go through this material, there's some ways to pick it up. So these Australian troops are located in a particular, particular region uh, of Afghanistan. That is one way of looking for for instance, there's other abbreviations such as Oz uh, and obviously keywords um, uh, such as Australia. It, it's worth remembering that these are reports by US forces. Now, they do sometimes uh, overlap um, with the activities of Australian forces because there can be combined operations uh, or uh, transports, but uh, purely Australian operations uh, will not be included in this material. One of the interesting things that I did see included was a, a report uh, to the U.S. Embassy in Kabul uh, speaking about the change of Australian-Afghan policy under uh, John Howard, uh, I think it was in, in 2006. Um, and the embassy in Kabul was made aware of this um, and what it would be and the, and the, the upcoming details um, some weeks uh, before... Uh, the Australian public uh, was made aware.